This crisis was not an accident. It was caused by an out-of-control industry. Since the 1980s, the rise of the U.S. financial sector has led to a series of increasingly severe financial crises. Each crisis has caused more damage, while the industry has made more and more money. After the Great Depression, the United States had 40 years of economic growth without a single financial crisis. The financial industry was tightly regulated. Most regular banks were local businesses, and they were prohibited from speculating with depositors' savings. Investment banks, which handled stock and bond trading, were small private partnerships. In the traditional uh, investment banking partnership model, the partners put the money up. And obviously, the partners watched that money very carefully. They wanted to live well, but they didn't want to bet the ranch on anything. Paul Volcker served in the Treasury Department and was chairman of the Federal Reserve from 1979 to 1987. Before going into government, he was a financial economist at Chase Manhattan Bank. When I left Chase to go in the Treasury in 1969, I think my income was in the neighborhood of $45,000 a year. $45,000 a year. Morgan Stanley, in 1972, had approximately 110 total personnel, one office, and capital of $12 million. Now, Morgan Stanley has 50,000 workers and has capital of several billion and has offices all over the world. In the 1980s, the financial industry exploded. The investment banks went public giving them huge amounts of stockholder money. People on Wall Street started getting rich. I had a friend who was a bond trader at Merrill Lynch in the 1970s. He had a job as a train conductor at night because he had three kids and couldn't support them on what a bond trader made. By 1986, he was making millions of dollars and thought it was because he was smart. The highest order of business before the nation is to restore our economic prosperity. In 1981, President Ronald Reagan chose as Treasury Secretary the CEO of the investment bank Merrill Lynch, Donald Reagan. Wall Street and the President do see eye to eye. I've talked to many leaders of Wall Street. They all say we're behind the President 100%. The Reagan administration, supported by economists and financial lobbyists, started a 30-year period of financial deregulation. In 1982, the Reagan administration deregulated savings and loan companies, allowing them to make risky investments with their depositors' money. By the end of the decade, hundreds of savings and loan companies had failed. This crisis cost taxpayers $124 billion and cost many people their life savings. It may be the biggest bank heist in our history. Thousands of savings and loan executives went to jail for looting their companies. One of the most extreme cases was Charles Keating. Mr. Keating, you got a word? In 1985, when federal regulators began investigating him, Keating hired an economist named Alan Greenspan. In this letter to regulators, Greenspan praised Keating's sound business plans and expertise and said he saw no risk in allowing Keating to invest his customers' money. Keating reportedly paid Greenspan $40,000. Charles Keating went to prison shortly afterwards. As for Alan Greenspan, President Reagan appointed him chairman of America's central bank, the Federal Reserve. Greenspan was reappointed by Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush. During the Clinton administration, deregulation continued under Greenspan, and Treasury Secretaries Robert Rubin, the former CEO of the investment bank Goldman Sachs, and Larry Summers, a Harvard economics professor. The financial sector, Wall Street, being powerful, having lobbies, having lots of money, step by step uh, captured the political system, you know, both on the Democratic and the Republican side. By the late 1990s, the financial sector had consolidated into a few gigantic firms, each of them so large that their failure could threaten the whole system. And the Clinton administration helped them grow even larger. In 1998, Citicorp and Travelers merged to form Citigroup, the largest financial services company in the world. 
The merger violated the Glass-Steagall Act, a law passed after the Great Depression, which prevented banks with consumer deposits from engaging in risky investment banking activities. It was illegal to acquire travelers. Greenspan said nothing. The Federal Reserve gave him an exemption for a year, and then they got the law passed. In 1999, at the urging of Summers and Rubin, Congress passed the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, known to some as the Citigroup Relief Act. It overturned Glass-Steagall and cleared the way for future mergers. Why do you have big banks? Well, because banks like monopoly power, because banks like lobbying power, because um, banks when they know that when they're too big, they will be bailed.